so pleased that Nathan Phillips from BU, and he's such a, an activist with, with the four of the resident kids at the Resident Station. Uh, Nathan has been a real ally uh, with the fight that we've been having for over four and a half years. So, you know, Nathan has been there at lots of rallies. And do you want to call him? Okay, Nathan Phillips! <laughs> Thank you, Margaret, for inviting me to be part of this, and thank you, Yvonne, and all the organizers, Frax, and it's really an honor to, to be with you, to be with the art community, at, speaking as a scientist, speaking as a resident. I live in Newton. Um, I'm a parent. I care about the same things that you do in the communities of the South Shore and what's happening in Weymouth, Quincy, Braintree, Hingham, that area. And I think it's so crucial that we have different ways of seeing this problem and seeing our own humanity. This is called the Ice Sea, is that? The Eyes. The Eyes Sea, and the Mind Wanders. And as someone who has been done science for the last 20 some years, I've had a certain way of seeing and putting data out there, but I'm also aware that as Pops. Here we have other things to see that facts are not enough. Data is not enough. Providing numbers to someone, it's, it's crucial and it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And so when we look around here, just, just in this short period of time, I'm never going to look at King's Cove again after seeing what your vision is there of King's Cove. And to think about the entire Four River and King's Cove, and to be able to envision what it was and what it could be instead of what we're told it should be, like a throwaway place. It's the place where there's already these facilities. Well, that's where more of those should belong. Somehow, to be um, tr tr uh, attempted to be conditioned to think of this place as a, a throwaway place and that the people that live in that area don't deserve better than that. It requires different ways of, of seeing. And I will, are these clingers? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so I'll never look at the shore uh, uh, along King's Cove at the parcel at 50 Bridge Street again um, after I've looked at Joe's renderings of these shoreline rocks and these being coal ash residue and the bricks imprinted with the, with the uh, information that are strewn all over that landscape. So even the things that you could say are the throwaway litter of humanity in a weird kind of way have their own kind of beauty, if you will. Sandra Steingraber is a, is a biologist, a PhD biologist who is going to visit Boston on September 18th. And she'll be visiting the site at 50 Bridge Street. She'll be coming to Boston University and giving a talk that evening, 7 to 9 p.m. You should all show up. She's an incredible writer, scientist, activist, and she's also allowed us to see our problem in ways that completely blew me away. She, I saw her, the last time she was in Boston was probably a couple years ago, and she was giving a talk in JP, and she was literally describing where the fracking occurs, like a mile below the earth, as an ecosystem. There is an ecosystem. There's life down there. There are microbial um, organisms down there, and it is an ecosystem. And then the fracking process completely warps and disrupts that ecosystem. But I had never pictured, I had never seen it with my mind that this part of that whole process that, that we are disrupting. And how if we don't treat our ecosystems and our environment with respect, they can turn into something very detrimental to all life. So I, as a scientist, really began to think about the connection to art as a way of seeing 
and both the limitations of science on its own, but the power of science um, to allow us to see. And in fact, the joining of science, art, and advocacy and activism together as being synergistic and even more powerful. It really started for me about 10 years ago when my career as a scientist really broadened in an unexpected way. So just to wind back, I'm a tree physiologist. The core of my knowledge is about how trees function, how water goes the water cycle and the water rains down, it goes to this soil, it's taken up by the roots, transported through the trunk, out the branches and out the leaves. And at the same time, the carbon dioxide is being taken up in photosynthesis at the same little places on the leaves where the water is going out. So my career has really, the, mo the uh, kind of the first two thirds of my career was looking at the intricacies of that process in individual trees and in forests and understanding how climate change may impact those processes. And then I think it was in 2009 or 10, I'm forgetting now, literally by serendipity on a walk a couple blocks away from my home in Newton with my son, we stumbled upon a person, his name is Bob Ackley, who measures gas leaks. And he had this kind of Ghostbusters looking kind of cone thing and he's it looks a little bit like a, a metal detector, and he's, he's walking around at the base of a tree. And my son and I saw this kind of person doing this, and we just walked over and said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm measuring gas leaks, and they kill trees. Mm -hmm. So as a tree physiologist, I, I'm thinking, what? I had no idea. I, I didn't even know what a gas leak smelled like. Mm -hmm. And from that moment, it was like a wormhole into a whole other set of issues. Never in my career did I think I'd be studying explosions or, or you know, the conditions that can lead to explosions. And I happened to have kind of an accidental toolkit that I could bring to bear on this issue of the gas leaks because I had been measuring greenhouse gases in the forest. And methane, the biggest component of these pipeline gas leaks, is a massively powerful greenhouse gas. So I knew how to measure these things, and a lot of the skill set kind of like translated over. And there's so many questions still to be addressed in the nature of this problem, but we know it is a big problem uh, on the scale of killing the trees at the spot of the leak, of potential explosions in and around where these leaks are, if it builds up into confined spaces or in a basement. We know that it leads to degraded air quality as it participates in photochemistry, the methane and the gases, parts of the natural gas, it's a mix of, of compounds, and that they can create formaldehyde in the air, uh, ground level ozone, these are all bad for all living things in the, in the ground area. And then, as such a powerful greenhouse gas, it has these global impacts as well. And so the research that we did, you know, was about numbers, but it was also about seeing and letting the mind see. And what we realized was that this problem of gas leaks across greater Boston, across the entire eastern seaboard because of our old aging infrastructure, is something that the industry knew about, they've known about it for a long time. The regulators have known about this. It's just that you and I never knew about it. The research community didn't know about it. Academics, they had no idea. And it was because we couldn't see it. It's buried infrastructure. It's out of sight, out of mind. And, and so people would tell me as we were start mapping these gas leaks across Boston and greater Boston, People would say, we'd see people, we'd be stopped at a leak and kind of like trying to sleuth out, well, where exactly is it coming out of the ground? And people would say, what are you doing? Just like I was asking when I met Bob Ackley and we're saying, well, there's a gas leak here. And, and you know, hundreds of anecdotes from people saying, oh yeah, I, I, I knew about this, I always smelled it. Or when I'm on my jog or my walk here, I always smell a gas leak over here. So you've got hundreds of anecdotes that we, you know, came across. But no one 
is putting it all together. And so, just like I did, and, and so when we produced a map and we published a map where you could see on a Google map all of these spikes, it looks like a porcupine if you pl plot it on Google Earth. We plotted 3,356 gas leaks in Boston, and that was when everyone, all at the same time, whoever would look at it, could all see the scope of that problem within the city of Boston. So that, to me, was when making science visible really uh, had an impact. But then, to take it to the level of art, um, I, for me, one of the most wonderful kind of um, relationships between science and art that I've had is an interaction with an artist professor at Mass Art. Her name is Jane Marshing. And she is a genius of art. And we riff off of each other because she looks at the science and it gets the wheels turning in her head about how to take that, whether it's numbers or a Google map or whatever, and turn it into something completely different and new ways of seeing. And they're simple things too. They're, they're not necessarily complicated things, but she would do things that once she did that, I'm like, of course that makes total sense to do that. Or in some case, cases, this is having an impact on me, but I don't even quite understand how or why, but it's having an impact. So for example, she and her students at Mass Art, we went on what we call our little gas leak safari around uh, Mass Art over there um, in um, Boston. And she took little flowers and would place the little flower stems into the drill holes where we had measured that the gas leaks were coming out so that anyone that would come by would be a little bit disrupted in their thinking, like what, what are these little flowers sticking out of the, the, the street for? They were marking and making visible um, in, in, in a kind of way I never would have thought of um, and, and kind of humanizing because of our, you know, how, how we think about flowers uh, the, the location of these gas leaks. She also was using sidewalk chalk to circle intense locations of the gas leaks right on the, the roadways and then starting to, do, she was writing down the, the actual numerical concentration of gas that was down there. So now you're actually, the data is, the scientific data is now being, you know, made visible right on the roadway itself. And that was one of those things where it's like, it was so powerful for me to see that, and, and it was such a simple act of art and, and science and, and utilizing the science. Um, and so I, I really began to benefit from, from and to learn of the power of art. And so um, I think I'm kind of going on a little longer than I uh, intended, but I'm going to just uh, finish with three points of where making the invisible visible has really had an impact that relates to the, the compressor uh, station, some of them. And so in the air, okay, so the methane, the gas, it's invisible, right? We don't see it. Um, but Margaret's video, I hope there's a chance maybe to play it before we leave, but it, when I saw that, we had, <coughs> my involvement has always been in, in this compressor battle for, is it five years now, Alice? Four and a half. Four and a half years. I went from being a cheerleader on the sidelines, social media, just like, you know, um, being there, but, but then it ramped up for me in a big way, um, maybe about nine months ago, when I finally said, all right, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, testify in a proceeding. And that's when it became, it, it took it to the next level for me. And so it's been a process of taking my scientific training and, and, and using that to make arguments and uh, plot data on a Google map again and, and this, this and that. And then about three months ago or so, um, I saw this video and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, I, I don't know how else to express the, the, the power of art than to have watched that video. And all of this stuff that we had talked about, 1,3-butadiene, it's a carcinogen. 
um, the neurotoxins that, that are there, but to see it as performance art in that way uh, was just devastating. And, and so that's an example of this invisible stuff in the air, to see it um, in a different way has a lot of power. To the underground, what, what's invisible, it's buried, it's out of sight, out of mind. That's another kind of invisibility, and our mind needs to see that as well. So as I mentioned, all of these pipelines, these 21,000 miles of pipe throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 7,000, just Massachusetts, 7,000 miles of those pipelines, about a third are leaking and leak prone. Um, you know, it, but it's out of sight, it's out of mind. And we need, like with Jane Marshing, and, and artists who allow us to start to see, to peel the layers off the street in, in a way. There's an artist by the name of uh, David McCauley who wrote a book called Underground, a graphic book that kind of like peels the layers off the street and you see the entire anatomy of the underground infrastructure. It starts to allow us to see what we can't see. Um, and, and also underground at the 50 Bridge Street, that it's a coal ash. The underground is a coal ash and there may be grass and vegetation on top, but what is underneath? And I think we need to, that needs to be uncovered both with the science and with the art uh, so much more uh, than it already has. And that leads me to my last point, which is invisibility of the, of the, of the social and political processes that should be transparent, but are being hidden from us. And that includes that coal ash that the site uh, at Bridge Street is literally made of that used to be open water. And I think it was Frank that shared that map where that peninsula was not there. It was open water. And it is literally now built on a toxic foundation. And so when we talk about opacity and hiding, from our ability to see by the agencies and entities that are supposed to be protecting our health and the public interest. I can't think of any more, um, any more of a failure of that duty than for these entities to basically say that that was historic film, to try to, to have a narrative that that was not a toxic, foundation, but it was historic fill. And, and fortunately, by the work of, of Frax and so many of you, to really make the truth visible and, and, and something that everyone can see that, and, and, and is so powerful that the regulators, the politicians, they can't look away. They have to face the fact of what is really underground. Um, and to have to, to deal with that situation. So, so the invisibility and the ability to see in those three areas are, are very important to me. So, you know, standouts on the bridge, that's, that's making the invisible visible. That's having your signs and, you know, all of these 30,000, 35,000 vehicles that are going by, letting them see, letting them know what is actually going on is so important. And so if you're not engaged yet, you're interested, you want to know more about that interaction between science, art, and advocacy for a better South Shore, better Four River, better planet for our kids, um, FRACS, all the information is right there and the Brain Trust is right here as well. So. Um, I'll just leave it at that and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Who has gas in your house? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations about turning on the gas? So, well, to start with, if you ever smell gas in your house, that is a big problem, and you should move out, right? take your pets and take your loved ones out of that house. Don't call while you're in the house. If you smell gas in your house, that's a dangerous situation. You should go out. And it's not unusual for there to be, we found it's not unusual for there to be gas leaks in houses. Now, it, it's 
I'm not going to say it's usual for them to be at explosive levels, but I will tell you that I had a gas leak in my basement in our house in Newton. Um, several of my colleagues and friends and advocates have had gas leaks right in front of their house or in their house. It is not unusual for that uh, to be the case. Now, so we have gas in my house, and I, don't, I want to acknowledge that we are all, to one degree or the other, embedded in a system that we are trying to change, and that, you know, we're complicit in it as well. I mean, if it's, I'm not gonna, we're not turning the gas off in the dead of winter in my home. I mean, we're, tr we're trying to stay warm like everyone else is. Um, but that does not mean that we are not, um, we don't have the right or our values shouldn't prevent us from taking the steps to move our system into a cleaner, safer, uh, more efficient energy system. And so there are ways in which we can start to make those changes. And it doesn't have to, it's not, you hear this trope, you can't change, we can't change overnight. Well, no one's saying we're gonna change overnight. We're gonna change it as, as swiftly as we can in a way that protects people and doesn't leave people behind. That's what we have to do. And, and so even in our own homes, like we are now cooking with um, induction basically, which is faster, cleaner, safer, more efficient, more precise than cooking with uh, gas or cooking with a coil resistance here. So, so, and that's like a $50 Ikea induction cooktop. It's our primary cooktop at home because it's just, it beats everything else. I mean, it literally will cook, it'll boil the same amount of water faster than gas turned up so high that it's actually, the flames are coming around the um, <laughs> side of the pot. So there are th things, that I, I say the entry fee to the energy transition is 50 bucks uh, at Ikea. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about that bill, um, what is it, at Future Act. Future Act. Yeah. Can you explain that? Because that sounds yes. like a great thing. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, a bill that uh, um, an advocacy coalition that I'm part of called, uh, we call ourselves the Gas Leak Allies, which is a, a bit of a strange name because we're not like allies of gas leak. We're allies that are trying to address the problem of the gas leaks. But it's an incredible group of um, 20 plus organizations and individuals um, that are in an alliance to solve this problem and um, they were instrumental we in drafting legislation uh, and then Senator Cindy Cream has taken that and authored this bill which we call the Future Act and uh, it, future the U stands for utility and you know it's an acronym makes sense I just can't remember what it, uh, the acronym stands for but it is about um, it's basically, you can think of it like our investor-owned utilities, like National Grid and Eversource, the gas, you know, they do gas and electricity. Um, it's really like evolve or die. It's, it's providing a pathway by which these utilities can strategically, cost-effectively start to move and, and start to um, get off of the gas where it makes sense, when it makes sense, and to move to cleaner, safer, electric-based heating. And electric-based heating means heating with heat pumps. So you're using some electricity, but you're using that electricity to harvest heat from either the air or from the ground. So it's actually a very powerful way and a very clean way and a very safe way to heat without essentially running combustible gases through these old pipelines um, into our homes, which has inherent risks to it. So the act has a bunch of different provisions, but it's basically allowing the utilities to kind of evolve or die. Oh, oh go ahead. Yeah, there was one of the things I saw and was about the DPU that, that uh, you were asking for Mara Neely, um, for the Attorney General, to uh, help appoint the members of the DPU, which would be a great idea for the DEP to. Oh, <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Exactly. Because there are so many problems with that. So right. How, how did that come, come about? I'm sorry, but I don't want to take all the time. But. 
Yeah, it's just that, I mean, people here know better than anyone how broken some of our agencies are, you know, including the DEP, the DPH, and the political pressure from the Baker administration straight down to just tell them to do things essentially with no regard to due process. I mean, it just, it, it, it was breathtaking for me to watch it play out where they just literally in the DEP air permit um, petition, the final ruling by the Office of Appeals and Dispute Resolution saying the petitioners were treated unfairly, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, the text, it, it, there, it says unfairly treated right in there, but it wasn't relevant anyway. And it just, it doesn't make sense at all. It, it's, it's really hard to believe this is happening. So that is all to say that the D, DPU is I, in its own way as broken as the DEP. And there needs to be other kinds of governance um, and, and, and ways in which we can have them serving the public interest more. And I, I think political appointees straight from the governor alone is not doing it right now. I have a simple question. Yeah. I'm wondering, because uh, the question of odor was brought up, and there's a section in Quincy when, when I'm going to uh, Walmart, I'm on the way to Walmart and I pass Facts and Commons, the whole area, and it smells terrible. And I, it, it never goes away. I always smell something like that. It just smells terrible. My question is, is this compressor station going to cause an ongoing odor yes. like that in that area? Yes. Yes. It will. Even if, yes. even if there's no crisis, it's just going to be a normal, yes. Mm, yes. really. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. And, 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 and you could say in the location in Quincy and so many other places, you might call it willful neglect. Because they know about it and they're just letting it go. If the proposed compressor station would go in, which it's not going to, um, <laughs> it would be intentional. It would be intentional fumigation of these neighborhoods. And it's just more egregious. And, it, and, and the amounts, too, would be really And, and something was mentioned about radius. How far would the radius be? Because my next notion is it's it's counterproductive. Because look at all that housing that just went up uh, Hingham Bay, yeah. uh, Hingham, um, Hingham uh, Shipyard. Yes. yes. All yes. that housing yes. in Weymouth, some, uh, even on um, Webb Park, yeah. something brand new just up and all this great Marina Bay, all yeah. these these phenomenal yeah. housing oh, yeah. units that are going right. up yes. so close to the station. Oh yes. Well there's the there's the zone of concern of explosion, blast radius zone, which does include residents, residential areas. Mm -hmm. And then there's the zone of influence of the emissions and the, the blowdowns, which are intentional venting of raw gas planned you know intentional and those are really going to depend on the particulars of where the of the atmospheric conditions at the time but literally i was just a couple weeks ago in newton same company enbridge blowing down a pipeline like a mile away from my house and i was we were measuring it and it was going a mile away and, and it's actually operating less of a pressure than what the compressor station would be operating at. So, so it's fumigating neighborhoods in Wellesley, fumigating neighborhoods in Newton. There was a, a, a residential street closest in Wellesley to where they were doing this pipeline blowdown. Um, we were measuring um, over 25 times the background methane level, it, it, right in the street, which means in the homes and the lawns of these homes right there. And, and it's not just that, that's an, the methane that we're measuring with our equipment is an indicator of all of the other stuff in there. So there's over a hundred volatile organic compounds. Dr. Kurt Norgard knows this stuff way more than I do. Susan Lees knows a lot about the health impacts of um, Greater Boston's Physicians for Social Responsibility. Understand the health impacts of the gas as well. And we're finding out more and more. Yeah. I, I live in California. Um, um, 
sorry to say that uh, we bought a gas stove. <laughs> we have natural gas everywhere over there. I wish I hadn't bought my gas stove a few years ago and I need to replace it. But, um, Where in California? Oxnard. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we did fight some sort of huge compressor thing. Uh, they wanted to put it offshore. And I don't know why they, if it was because of us or if some other thing came in consideration because of Navy base, but they decided not to do it. But and I know in Berkeley, uh, I know Berkeley is a little bit more futuristic, but they set in motion something in their city where they said that no more uh, gas appliances are going to be sold after, uh, and, or put into new homes or sold after like 2020 or something like that. But they're trying to start at the bottom. So yeah. each, if you nip the nip it in the bud if people make decisions about the market for gas appliances, then there's not going to be the market for the gas. So. It's so like, it's, anyway, people might think about that, but I know Berkeley is not like everybody Well, else. Well, now I've heard that it's not Berkeley, not only Berkeley, it, it, it's, it's kind of spreading, like, yeah. kind of like wildfire. I don't know if that's the right analogy to use, but um, Berkeley, Menlo Park, um, uh, Carlsbad, California, uh, I think like six municipalities now yeah. in California have done this gas ban on new construction, new buildings. Cambridge, Massachusetts, I mean, uh, Brookline has a warrant article under consideration right now. Yeah. Mothers Out Front has really led the way there. So Brookline might be the first community in Massachusetts to do a new construction, no gas hookup. Because that will do it. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and I'm aware that Cambridge, I mean, it's really starting to move pretty quickly. Cambridge is about ready to do this. And my town of Newton, I've been hearing that there's organizing to introduce uh, you know, ordinance in the same way. So I completely agree with you that there's a, there's a kind of top-down level at which change can be affected, but there's also municipality by municipality in which you know, we can operate from that level. Oh, sorry. Um, I just have one question about um, gas in cars. I mean, is, do you think there is going to be a, a move for electric cars? I mean, there already is something in the make, but is that something that we need to think about? Oh yes. I mean, we have to we have to electrify the transportation sector and get off the oil. I mean, that's and, and I believe it's inevitable. It's just how fast can it happen. Okay. And that speed at which it happens is going to be influenced by the policies that either try to slow it down or try to speed it, or, or just let it go. If, if we just let it go and got out of the way, um, the market is scaling in the way that, you know, it's kind of like how iPhones scale. It, they're, they're, it's a technology that just like takes on its own momentum and builds on itself. Um, and the reality is, I mean, if you just even look at like a weed whacker, you know, or any internal combustion machine. Like, you know, we've gotten really uh, into these complicated uh, engines on, on even something as small as a weed whacker where, but you know, you've got the spark plug and you've got the air fuel mixture, you gotta put some little oil in there. And, and it's so often that if it's out of tune, it's not gonna work, you know, you're pulling the thing and it's not, and, and just the number of moving parts Compared to electric uh, motors, it's just no comp there's no comparison. The, 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 there's vastly few m moving parts in these electric motors compared to the internal combustion ones. And so that make, makes it less maintenance and ultimately will make it, it, it's inherently simpler and should be less expensive and will be once the market scaling occurs. So, that does have to happen. Yes, I just want to mention, um, I run my whole entire um, video and filmmaking um, and photography off solar power. Um, I have two solar panels on top of my car, my SUV, but, and I've got, um, like when I go out filming, when I go anywhere on site, I'm running everything off solar power. The last movie, I, this movie I currently made, totally off solar power in my little studio at home, which I have solar panels at home, and um, all my tools and everything, I charge off those solar panels and the ones at home. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of fun. From out in the wilderness, in fact, we and Ron and I went to Yellowstone, and we, uh, we, the ranger stopped, and we had 
um, video set up. We had Yvonne was painting under a, a big screen, and she had this big hat net on, and we had every, I was had everything plugged into the solar panel, everything we needed. And the, we, the ranger came by, and we said, "Oh, what do we do? We're in trouble. We're out, you know, in the woods somewhere." He said, "What do we do?" And he comes up, and he says. This is the coolest setup I've ever seen at Yellowstone. He said, "Can I take a picture? I want to take a picture to show it to anybody back at the, you know, at the center." And um, so it's kind of, I mean, it's a fun thing to do, but it also makes the point too. You know, you're you're uh, you're triggering a, a a point that I was kind of hoping to make, and I'm I'm going to make it, which is to me when you talk about that experience, the term that comes to my mind is energy democracy, and energy democracy is something that cuts across the political spectrum you know people I, I saw a poll a few years ago that 70 percent of people who supported Trump support acceleration of clean energy um, solar energy no one is against solar energy and renewable energy except for the people who stand to gain profit from you know, or, or lose profit, you know, and market share. Um, and so the democratization of energy, I, I, I totally um, am with you on that. And, and it also made me rem remind myself that in talking about art, when I look at the mural here, that's like the democratization of art, that, that it's not just the amazing professional artists that are, are, have done this amazing work, um, but it's everyone that can participate. And then there's a democratization of the science itself that I really hope to promote. And I, as we leave here, you might even just see it, my bike is out there, and I am now mapping methane uh, on my bike with a little, that <laughs> nozzle that I said, the, the Ghostbuster kind of thing, yeah. it's on my bike, it's on the front fork of my bike. I came here, in fact, I'll just show you, um, and I mapped the methane with this little handheld uh, methane monitor. So this, where, does, where does one get something like that? Well, this one costs like 10,000, <laughs> it's $10,000. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's, okay. yeah. Um, and, and I, this is on loan to me from the manufacturer of this, um, but it, you know, it's it's actually allowing, like any one of you could put this in your car, on a bike, in a wheelchair. You could walk with it in a backpack, and you could be doing the science that I've been doing. So, it's the democratization of science, of energy, of art. Um, so. What is that machine called? It's an infrared methane analyzer. So, yeah. And Irwin is what this the unit is called. Uh, infrared something something. So. Yeah, you may want to talk about what solution is. Once it goes into the pipe, uh, and it's delivered through the distribution system, not the big gas lines, uh, but the uh, national grid system. Uh, yep. They don't care if it leaks because they get reimbursed by the total volume of. So a simple regulatory change yeah. that says yeah. all your leaks, you're not going to be able to put into your revenue base, right. would change radically uh, their action. The reason they're doing nothing now is because they get paid whether it leaks or not. Yeah, we pay for the lost and unaccounted for gas that they can't account for. That's like going and buying a, a you know a glass of lemonade and lemon lemonade sandwich with a little leak coming out of it, um, you know, and it's like oh you're paying for it anyway. That's the way this, this our system is right now, and so so those regulatory and legislative changes are needed to align the incentives.